Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the 21 News Podcast. I'm Managing Editor Justin Mitchell. As always, 21 News is the place where you can find the most comprehensive political coverage in the Valley. And there is no hotter race in Ohio, or perhaps even in the nation, than the race to determine who wins the Senate seat that will be vacated by Rob Portman at the end of his term. Now, on this podcast, we're looking to speak with each of the candidates in the running. The Democrats are looking to expand their majority and are so far consolidating their support behind Valley Congressman Tim Ryan. The Republicans have more of an open field with five candidates currently declared and a few other names expected to jump in soon. So with us today is one of those Republicans running, Cleveland area investment banker Mike Gibbons. Thank you for being with us. Well, thanks for having me. So Ohio's Republican Party is at a little bit of a crossroads with a Republican governor who is still got a pretty high popularity rating, but has some unpopularity with the right wing of the party, sort of a traditional wing that wants to get back to a more pragmatic, conservative policy approach, and then a vocal sector uh, who joined the party specifically in support of the former president, Donald Trump, and they support a more brash style in, in that vein. So I'm going to start by asking you the same thing I asked Jane Timken last week, which is how do you define yourself as a candidate in that in that backdrop? Uh, well, I'm uh, I'm a constitutional conservative without exception, um, and you know I believe in small government. I believe that uh, the government shouldn't be intrusive in our lives. Um, so I've been somewhat critical of, of Governor DeWine's performance during COVID. Um, I, uh, I don't, I never had a problem wearing a mask. I'm not all about masks. Um, you know, but I consider it more of just trying to be, you know, accommodative to the people around that are frightened about it. Um, you know, certainly the people that are, that are more apt to, uh, uh, or, or, or more at risk. So I, you know, I just took it as something that wasn't that big a deal. Now I don't like masks any any more than anybody else, but I figure if uh, if if you know if, if people are upset about it, why make them more upset? But I I would have handled it much differently. I'm a businessman. I spent my whole life, you know, trying to trying to do the right thing in order to optimize the situation, and it was not optimized. We knew very early on who was at risk. We knew very on who was susceptible to the virus. Uh, I would have moved to protect those individuals. I would have moved to uh, support those individuals so that they could stay away from uh, fr from other people as long as they could. Um, and I think I would have, and if you did that correctly, I don't think we would have had to shut a business in the state. And um, I, I guess more of the Florida approach, I would say. And uh, you know, so consequently, you have, uh, you know, you have this, you know, I won't even call it ideal, ideological break. It's a philosophical break in the Republican Party right now. I think a year from now, this will be in the mirror and, you know, in the rearview mirror and nobody will care about masks anymore. And maybe it won't be an issue. Sure, sure. So, so how you say you would have handled it differently. I mean, can you be specific as to what you exactly how you would have handled it differently? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's very easiest for to identify the at-risk people. They, they're going to have to kind of self-identify. But, you know, I think one of the founders' principles was that we're all individuals. And as individuals doing everything in our power to succeed, um, the whole country succeeds. That's, that's not the left's view of how things should work. Um, and I think in this case, with uh, with COVID, we all have individual responsibilities for ourselves. The government wasn't responsible for us, uh, nor should it be. And uh, and I think people in nursing homes, for instance, we do very well that elderly were at risk. Um, and I would have, I, you know, I would have put a, a guardrail around the nursing homes. I think that people that are obese. Um, it became very early on, you know, March of last year, March or April of last year, we had a pretty good idea that, uh, I mean, I'm talking about 2020, that, uh, uh, that, that those people are at risk. If you had diabetes, we knew you were at risk. Those people should have been warned. We should have made sure that they knew what was going on and, and told that they had to be more careful than everybody else. And, uh, and I would have, 
you know, tried to support those people. They said, you know, I'm a, I'm in one individual. I, you know, I, I can't walk to the store, um, but I'm obese and I have diabetes. I would have said, fine, we're going to call on, you know, we could have put together, we had the money coming from the federal government. We, we get to put on a task force to, to do their shopping for them. That is, those are the people, a relatively small percentage of the population in Ohio, I believe that we should, as uh, fellow citizens, make sure they were safe. And, uh, but that required personal responsibility on their parts, and it required, uh, I think, a little bit of foresight by our government. Now, to that end, because we we obviously have covered COVID a lot, and we've talked to various, I mean, not just political uh, experts, but also uh, some of the top virologists in the world. And one thing that they've told us, and obviously this is a moving target when it came out. I mean, we were learning sure. about this as it happened. So one thing that I know that we've the, that the top virologists in the world have told us is that if there's a widespread among a population, even if that population's not vulnerable, that it allows for more mutations of the virus so that it becomes more dangerous for different populations. So given that, or if you saw signs of it spreading or mutating in a way where the the vulnerable population was changing, do you change with it or does it or is it still just a hard line personal responsibility issue for you? Well, I think I think it is a hard line re- personal responsibility. Don't get me wrong, but but um, that doesn't mean we couldn't have social distanced and, and we couldn't have worn masks. But to shut down restaurants, you know, we I, a lot of the restaurants and bars that you now go into, you see these these uh, plate, uh, lucite barriers between the between the places at the bars and and between the, the you know, between the tables. Um, you know, what we discovered, and this was more recent, is this virus is, is an aerosol. And th- those were useless. Um, you know, and I think, again, if, if, uh, if, if you're healthy, if you're, you're not in an age that was at risk, um, you know, I, I can't, I, I'm not a virologist, certainly, but, you know, if you've got the virus, uh, many times you were asymptomatic. I have lots of friends that were got the virus and never knew they had it. Um, you know, I would have let it play through. Uh, I think uh, as long as that person wasn't at risk of serious injury or death, um, you know, they we, we should not have been uh, assisting them to any great degree. They they were on their own. If they were frightened of getting COVID, they could stay home just like the elderly people or the people with diabetes. You know, as I said, it's it's if you 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 tell the people what the situation is. If you go out and you're hanging around a bar, there's, it's a, a super spreader event. You're putting yourself at risk. But if you're 35 years old, maybe not a problem. Maybe you're willing to accept that risk. That's up to them. Um, and I, and as far as the spreading and mutations, I haven't heard anything like that. You know, there are mutations. I know that, and, but usually uh, uh, we haven't fomented any of them or, 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 or uh, created any of those in the U.S. Uh, it's it's the last one I, where the Delta virus is coming from. Uh, I think it's being passed to us from England right now. Uh, you know, I think obviously you want to report on if there's a new risk out there. But uh, and, and I know they're talking about now that Delta, the Delta virus could uh, end up uh, causing another uh, outbreak. That's very possible. But with the people with vaccines, with people that have had it, um, they should be impervious to that with few exceptions. There are some some uh, people that are, are, are at risk. And if you feel you did, don't trust the vaccine and you don't, even though you've gotten it and you, and you don't trust the fact that you're protected, then stay home. Sure, but isn't there some intersection between um, between personal responsibility and public health in terms of being afraid of potentially overrunning hospitals and ultimately denying care for people who are being personally responsible? Well, I think what what I preface this with is you are protecting the people that were over that potentially could overrun the hospital. Um, you, okay. you were protecting the elderly, you were protecting the at-risk people. Those are the people that filled our hospital beds. And by the way, none of them really got filled. Uh, 
um, you know, we, it was a lot of uh, caution, of course, and people were worried. Uh, I think it was a little blown out of proportion. Even in New York City, there was plenty of hospital beds. Uh, and, and then we, you know, the, the president provided more and they were never used. And it was, we, you know, from listening to the news, it was a major crisis, and it wasn't. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure anybody was telling us the honest truth anywhere through this. Uh, they, were, they were actually thinking that we weren't smart enough to figure it out, so uh, they're going to tell us whatever they thought uh, would induce us to behave the way they wanted them to. But I think if, when all was said and done, if you're 35 years old uh, and and you wanted to go to a bar and you wanted to take the risk, I wouldn't have shut the bars down. Uh, I would have I would have kept those open. I would have kept every business open, and I would have made sure people were aware of the risks. And if they were willing to assume that risk, that's up to them. Um, so and, more, and I and I, I, mean, I understand yeah. the pul- public health situation. I mean, if, if 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 this was something a little more dangerous than COVID, if this was SARS, which had a 15% infection rate, maybe different. It wasn't. Sure. So your answer is specific to this virus that you think it was yes. mishandled and not and there necessarily. Are public, right. I mean, if everybody has a, you know, I guess Ebola is, got, is very contagious um, and a few others are, I, I think we'd have to have a different plan. Now. In this current Senate race right now, specifically the Republican race, the two candidates uh, that are currently polling the highest, and I know there's minimal polling out there and it's mostly internal stuff, but um, from what's been put out there so far, it appears that former treasurer Josh Mandel is still in the lead, styling himself as, as much as he can in sort of the Trump vein, leaning into cultural issues and sort of an attack tweet style. Um, and the other, is the former Ohio GOP chairwoman, Jane Timken. And, uh, you know, I interviewed her last week in this series of podcasts, and she says she's really banking on being able to unite the traditional business conservative wing of the party and the Trump wing through a focus on economic and trade issues primarily. So my question is, for a candidate like yourself, who currently is polling around 5%, where do you see your opening to rise to the top in this race? Well, I, those two candidates have both already gone to the media. Um, and they have, Josh Mandel's been spending money, I've, been, I've heard as much as $50 million on making sure everybody in the state knew his name. Um, those are largely uh, name recognition polls. And Jane has spent a good bit of money, seven figures, uh, in my understanding, on, on, uh, on broadcast TV and on cable. Uh, we're going to do that. Um, and we're going to do it. I mean, I, actually, I, I'm not allowed to tell you, but we're going to do it. And we're going to do it in mass. Um, the last election I ran with six months to go was my first speech was in December before the May primary. And uh, nobody really took me seriously. Um, in fact, at one point, uh, Jane Timken sat in my office and said, Mike, we're going to be totally neutral. Well, um, once we started getting out there, um, we started picking up steam and, uh, and we saw ourselves rising in the polls. And frankly, the Republican Party had different plans. And um, they, they threw the endorsement, the state endorsement at, at my opponent. Uh, who's a good guy, by the way, uh, and uh, they brought Donald Trump in. But even in a in a in a race where I campaigned for six months, um, if you count my first political speech uh, to, to the to the May seventh primary, um, and, and with you know with literally no name recognition on on December seventh and no votes, nobody's going to vote for me. I ended up with 32% of the vote and I won 38 counties. I'm hoping that those people that voted for me the last time remember me. Because I think 32%, particularly the way this thing is shaping up, will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll walk away with the victory here. Uh, and I have a year now. And I frankly have a lot more uh, 
dollars are going to have a lot more dollars invested. It was a it was a uh, a learning experience for me, the last time, and uh, and it was frankly a lot of fun. I enjoyed meeting all the people in the state. I, I traveled to most to all the counties at least once, and uh, I, what I found is people want to listen to somebody that isn't a politician. They want to hear the truth, and when I tell my personal story, uh, it, I think it's something you can trust that I'm not out to spend the rest of my life in Washington. I'm out to do exactly what I say I'm going to do. And that's represent American principles in every case. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't believe this country is, uh, um, is, is an evil place. I don't believe this country is, is, is systemically racist. And, uh, and I believe that what people want to hear is the truth. They want to hear, uh, it from somebody that they can believe. And, and I think, you know, to elect somebody that has never spent a day in the private sector or to elect somebody that has no, uh, nothing they can point to as, as personal success in their whole lives other than winning an election, um, I don't think people are willing to do that. I don't think they're willing to vote for those people. And I think we kind of half proved it the last time. And as I said, I won 32 percent of the vote, many of them in co counties that Trump took. Um, you know, it, it winning 38 counties, even though Donald Trump was actively campaigning for my opponent. So I, I was, and, and it was kind of crazy because I just was able to tell Donald Trump this for the first time down in Florida. Um, and he didn't know it, by the way, he was just told to do something and he did it. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I, if, if I can, uh, ensure people that I believe in the Trump agenda, which I do, uh, that I was an active supporter of Donald Trump. Every single candidate, and it's, it, you'll, you'll enjoy this as this goes on, but uh, every single candidate says they're the Trumpiest candidate there is. And I, I'm not even going to get into that quarrel. I, I mean, I, I'm just going to tell you, I was finance co-chair for Ohio in the Trump campaign in 16, and again in 20. I raised a lot of money for him, and I gave him a lot of money for me. And, uh, you know, I, I think everybody else is busy erasing their tweets and, and their Facebook pages that they where they criticize the president. I don't have to do that. I never did it. Um, you know, I think some some people don't approve of Donald Trump's you know, personality or behavior or whatever. Um, believe me, I was willing to accept every quirk he had rather than what we have now. And uh, so I was never somebody who was going to criticize him for anything because I loved his, the policies he was enacting. So what, uh, what would your key issues be then? I mean, you say you love the policies. What, it, once they start to get to know you and, uh, and you're seeking to sort of not peak too soon, but have that moment where you rise, right. what are the issues that you, that you think will resonate? Well, you know, I, if, if this was two years ago, it would have been much different. You know, I, I, very concerned about our healthcare system. I, you know, spent a lot of time understanding it. Uh, I believe that until we have certain things enacted, like tri price transparency for treatment, things like that, that prices are only going to continue to rise. We're forty percent higher than the next closest Western democracy. It's ridiculous. Uh, but I will tell you, I right now, I think the primary. Uh, the, the the primary problem that that we face is the this narrative of the Democrats and how they're they want to radically transform this country. Uh, you know, it seems very odd to me that hundreds of millions of people would move here tomorrow, and and somehow they describe our country as defective and 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 evil. Um, the, the idea that 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 we are somehow all racist. And uh, we have to transform ourselves. To me, is is a false narrative. Um, I believe that we were making terrific progress on the racial side, and that it, it was certainly prior to Barack Obama coming in, I think he made the the, the, the country more div divisive. Uh, certainly before he came in, uh, I thought we were making tremendous progress. The the inequality that is out there. Well, you know what. <laughs> 
it, it isn't the people in, in middle Ohio and the farmland that is creating the inequality. Um, if there's inequality, it's, it's because they live in Democrat-run cities that control Democrat-run school systems where they're getting educations that don't translate into a reasonable job. And uh, it, it's, it's always funny on the part, the projection on the part of, of the Democrats, we're the evil racists, yet they've been in charge in all these cities for many, many years, many times for generations, and it's their school systems that are failing. You know, in, 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 as far as is black men being, uh, being abused by police, sure, there's, there's bad policemen, and, and, but they're a very small percentage. And I might add, they're policemen in those Democrat-run cities. They had every opportunity to fix the police force. There isn't, um, you know, other than Indianapolis, I can think of, every major city is run by a Democrat. And, and those cities are the ones where, where unarmed black men have been shot. And yet, somehow, it's the Republicans' fault. And, uh, and I, I, I feel that is an absolute lie. And, and I think that has become a very important part of my campaign because it's become so important to the future of our country. We can't have this country, uh, you know, in the midst of a race war um, when, when everybody that I know, I don't even know a racist uh, under the old definition. Um, and, uh, and I just don't believe it's true. And I, I believe we need somebody out there fighting for the truth. When you say that the that the democratic position is that this country is is racist and that, and that and that people are fundamentally evil, I think was the word you used. Well, no, I, mean, I said I the country is evil. The yeah. country yeah. is evil. So, so who has said that? I mean, I understand that's a narrative out there, but Joe I can't Biden. quote somebody. Joe, Joe Biden has definitely Joe not said those words. Well, Joe I mean, Biden said it on national TV. He said this country is systemically racist. <laughs> well, sy systemic racism is not the same, though. So that's what I, I just I want to get a handle on what the narrative is versus what the policy is. Well, I, I think you can conflate the two things if the policy is to radically transform the country. And as far as systemic racism goes, I think I just pointed out to you the systemic racism that does exist in Democrat cities. So what policies, what specific policies are you running in opposition to and what policies are you advocating for in their place? Well, first of all, um, I'm advocating that we start electing Republicans in the Democrat cities. And I'm advocating that um, we aren't teaching uh, our children um, that, we, that, that we're this horrible country and, and we are systemically racist. Um, there's, there's literally a, an ideology, you might even call it a religion called critical race theory right now, that's being taught in too many places in, in our, in our major companies, uh, in our military and in our, in our school systems. And, and so I'm advocating that that is not taught. And, and so define your opposition to that, because this is something we've done some stories on and we've spoken to some educators and education sure. experts. And, and what we found is that there is, at least in the audience, um, uh, some misunderstanding over what it is versus what it is perceived to be. So, so d for you, how do you define critical race theory? Well, I mean, I can t define it. I, I, I was a political flop. One of my majors was political philosophy. It's an offshoot of postmodernism. And, uh, and, and in critical race theory, um, in, in, you know, I, I don't want to get in, in, the wood, in the weeds here, but Immanuel Kant wrote a book called Critique of Pure Reason. And he was the first chink in the armor of, of the entire enlightenment. enlightenment. Uh, that's been modified. And, and I believe what happened is, is that in the 50s and 60s, the people that were Marxists and socialists recognize the fact that it had been an abject failure and cost hundreds of millions of lives and it didn't work. The capitalism not only wasn't going to suppress anybody, it was making the whole world rich. So they had to come up with a new story. And the new story was, uh, we still like socialism and we can't figure out how to objectively uh, describe it as anything that's good for anybody. 
So we're going to reject the facts. We're going to reject facts. We're going to reject reason. And, uh, and we're going to reject science. And that is the basis of critical race theory. It has nothing to do with teaching about slavery. Nothing. Um, it, it, is a, it, it is a philosophy. It, as I said, an offshoot of, uh, offshoot of postmodernism. They now have feminist critical theory. They have, um, you know, all, all these uh, philosophies that are based on, on, um, you know, on this postmodern rejection of facts and reason. And what becomes important is perception. And that's what they're trying to that's what they're trying to teach our children right now. They're doing it in kind of a backhanded way. Uh, but I want to I want to eliminate it from our educational system. It's it's a it was a faulty theory when uh, when it was a postmodernist theory. It's a faulty theory now. And uh, and but I will tell you this: I have absolutely no problem. And by the way, I went to school ages ago, and I learned all about slavery. And not only that, I read many books on slavery. I know. As much about slavery certainly is more than the average person because I was interested in finding out exactly what it was about. And it wasn't about white people trying to suppress the black people. It was, it was a, 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 a practice that was, was engaged in for thousands of years all across the world. Uh, and, and we had a, a system of government largely uh, defined by our constitution, which I think is the greatest governing document in the history of the world, that would allow us to overcome it. And we had 600,000 people die trying to get rid of it. And I, and I think there's a reason to celebrate the fact we did that. Uh, now, yes, there were tough times and I, and, and uh, you know, my, my background is, is where I, I just didn't grow up with any kind of a, a, of a racist attitude. My dad was a high school teacher and a wrestling coach and, a third to half of his teams were, were, were black kids. And my dad loved those kids the same way he loved his, if they were a good wrestler, he didn't care what color you were. It was uh, they could have been purple. And, uh, and, and I grew up that way. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to get back to the colorblind attitude that Martin Luther King believed in. Now, to, I mean, some, when I said we talked to some educators about what critical race theory is or isn't, what some of right. them said, and I'm curious your take on this, because because what we're talking about here is obviously pretty in the weeds, as you said, and it's it's often <laughs> university level. But yes. what about a simpler idea that we simply should teach from more from more perspectives, and how the different perspectives of different people can impact life today and that race does play a role in some sense i mean i guess there's a, there's a fuzziness here because there's a move in ohio to ban what they call divisive concepts teaching divisive concepts and yet there's an argument to be made that teaching about and and discussing these divisive concepts is how we enlighten people so where do you draw the line in terms of teaching about everybody's cultural history well, I don't. First of all, I don't think our cultural history is is that important. But you're right. I think people coming from a different cultural background have different perceptions. But if the cultural background says mathematics don't matter, then we got to change them and make make them aware of what our culture is, where mathematics does matter. You know, we've learned from cultures all over the world. We eat food from cultures all over the world. We enjoy the cultures all over the world. We we. We don't have to understand and uh, appreciate every nuance of every culture, but but I do believe that that we we have already done that. I mean, I think when we when when you study Turkey, you learn the customs and 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 the uh, the likes and dislikes of the average Turkish person. I think you know African Americans are thirteen percent of the country. There's far more Irish in this country than there are African Americans. We're not studying the perceptions from the Irish people. Um, it, you know, it's it's uh, it, it, you know I don't I don't think singling out a particular race to treat them differently because of their perception is going to be good is going to be good in the long term for our country. Uh, we are a Western country, and, and we we did we do we did uh, celebrate the Enlightenment. We 
we adopted Western philosophy, and and frankly, I don't want to change that one iota. But I'm not talking about to necessarily to treat somebody differently, but we're talking about enlightenment and understanding. And while it's true that there are, yeah, I mean, you're right, there's far more Irish in America, but there were not laws on the books treating the Irish as if they were less than a human being within, the, within a generation or two. So certainly there is an impact that could still be felt a generation or two later. And understanding that, you would not- No, I agree with you 100%. Okay. I agree. And, and what, what they went through is- was wrong and and it you know and frankly I think we've cleaned a lot of it up. You know I I'm an investment banker, um, and and we try you know we try to hire the best people. Um, and right now, uh, for me to hire a, an African American finance major is almost impossible. Only three percent of of uh, African American graduates are finance majors. Um, and I can tell you, the best of them are sucked up by Goldman Sachs in New York long before I can get a hold of them. Uh, you know, there's, there's, that can't change because I want it to change. Uh, that can't, even, even if we make an effort, and we do, we, you know, we have, um, you know, pretty diverse group, but, uh, but we can't on a dime say, oh, all of a sudden we're going to just hire every black person. You can't do it. It, it doesn't work because there are certain basic skills that there are not enough of them out there that we can hire them. Uh, so you can't just change, you know, this this idea that we're tired of waiting and it now all all has to change. What I would like to see see happen is that the school system is improved. That we open and, and the best way to do that in my mind is is push more private schooling and charter schooling. Because our public school systems, particularly in the inner city, have failed us. I mean, beyond failed us. Uh, and, and that has to change, or we're never going to be able to try to, to uh, or, or the, the, the African American population as a whole is never going to be able to climb out of that inequality because they're not being educated properly. And I have to tell you, I believe it's solely at the feet of the Democrat Party. So, as a senator, um, what would what policy do you think would uh, would accomplish what you're what you're going for here? Well, I mean, I think I think we need to go back, as I said, to Martin Luther King, where, where an individual is judged on the basis of his character, um, and that should not change one iota. Um, and there are a lots, you know, with with the the wokeism that is out there right now in in our corporate uh, in our particular our large corporations, they. That's unacceptable to them now, at least to their diversity consultants, and and they're going to fail. And and uh, and what we ought to do is be encouraging a philosophy that first of all that we all get along and like each other and love each other the way we're supposed to, and uh, and let's not try to create a situation where all we're doing is is setting people up to fail, and because I believe that's what happens. When you open your admissions to, and I've been through this with with, with my own uh, personal experience. You, when you when you let somebody in a school that can't do the work, it, you know, I, you you just you kill the kid. And uh, and we and, and so it has to come from the very beginning. Uh, you know, where the large the great majority of of, of kids, and it's not just black kids, it's white, white kids in certain parts of the country are, don't have fathers. Um, you know, there's a very simple rule. And it was, uh, it was, it's been issued by the Brookings Institution a number of years ago. If you graduate from high school and you get a job and you wait till you're married to have kids, you have exactly a 5% chance of ending up in poverty. That's not that tough a rule. But we don't teach that. And the idea that that you can reject the nuclear family, uh, you know, these aren't things that the government even, frankly, should be involved in, in my mind. But what I've seen out of the Democrat administration currently is that they want to get involved in this kind of thing. And, and that is, to me, not great for the future of our country.
but you want to be a senator, and obviously that is a role in the federal government. So from a policy perspective, what what do you think the Senate should be doing? What what would you be doing as a senator? Well, first of all, we ought to be protecting our country <laughs> in, 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 in building roads uh, where it requires federal involvement, but they certainly shouldn't be involved in anything other than, than what's uh, defined by the Constitution. And we have the federal government want, wanting to federalize everything. And I think you just saw that with S1 and HR1. Um, first of all, it was unconstitutional. I don't think it would have ever gotten through. But um, I mean, and, and what they did is they built the entire bill on a false narrative. Now we're seeing some people come around. I think Stacey Abrams just said she was never against forcing people to have IDs. Um, but, but they've taken things that are um, things like IDs, which 80% of the country supports, um, are, you know, are racist. They're not racist. They're a requirement for a full, full and fair election. And, and I think everybody realizes that, what, no matter what color you are, whatever, no matter who you are. Um, but again, I would be against those types of moves by the federal government, and I would fight those moves. Um, I think we need to clean up the immigration system. I think we need to clean up the healthcare system. I have ideas uh, that I'd be happy to get into on all those things. Um, but you know, I understand why people are pouring across the border, because they want to come to the greatest country in the world. They want a better economic life for their kids. I get that. But you can't have everybody that wants to come to America come all at once. It, we, we, we can't handle it. So you see the um, role as just being pretty, as being limited then. I mean, you, you see the role of the federal government as being traditionally very limited. And that's old school conservatism, correct? I mean, that's, that's what, that exactly what I am. I'm old school conservative. And now, we, of course, they're, they've got their, their fingers in every pie in the country. It's, it's not going to happen overnight. I'm not, you know, stupid enough to believe that this, this can all change. But if you have enough senators that understand the role of the federal government as that, you can begin to shift and, and, you know, turn the ship. And that's what has to happen. Well, I appreciate your time. I imagine that we will hear a lot from you in the coming days, as, as you sort of foreshadowed. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much.